Thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Christian Arboleda with Cleveland Clinic, and we are privileged to have a global audience online with us from 24 different countries. And we are very excited to be connecting with all of you for our fifth episode of our Global Connect webinar series. Thank you to our returning viewers, and welcome to those of you who are tuning in for the first time. As a special feature today, we have live translation into Spanish, which all of you can access and select in the lower part of your webinar screen. Also, we would like to ask our value audience members to complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar so we can listen to your feedback on our future episodes. Today, our future, future guest will be Nuria Diaz, Corporate Quality and Patient Experience Director at Quiron Salud, Dr. James Gutierrez, Chief Quality Safety and Patient Experience Officer at Cleveland Clinic London, and Tony Wormuth, Executive Director of Clinical Transformation at Cleveland Clinic, who will be interviewed by Prakash Chandrasekharan, Senior Director of International Business Development at Cleveland Clinic. Prakash, the floor is yours. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining uh, our fifth edition of our Global Connect webinar. Global Connect webinar. Um, working from home, telemedicine, things like Zoom conference, Teams call, go to meeting has become a verb like Xerox. Um, these things have become increasingly routine for many of many of us around the world. Um, but now many of our organizations are starting um, to look at the horizon on how to make the workplace a safe environment for employees to return, for patients to receive care, for customers to access our services uh, in, in, in every industry possible. Um, at the Cleveland Clinic, we, we pride ourselves on becoming the best place to receive care and the best place to work uh, in healthcare. We're also um, in, in the middle of this pandemic trying to make it the safest place to receive care and the safest place to work in healthcare. Um, I just wanna quickly reintroduce our guest today, um, Dr. Jim Gutierrez, um, our colleague um, uh, from Cleveland Clinic London, Chief of Quality and Patient Experience and um, uh, Chief of Quality Safety and Patient Experience at Cleveland Clinic London. Um, Tony Warmuth, Executive Director for Clinical Transformation, um, who's here in Cleveland, Ohio, about half hour, sitting half hour from where I sit. Um, and Ms. Nuria Diaz, um, Director of Corporate Quality and Patient Experience at Quran Salud, one of the largest healthcare providers in, in Spain. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, again, sorry about the technology issues. Um, We would also like all the participants to, if you have questions, to use the chat feature um, and, and type in your questions and we will be tracking them as, as you type them in and, and, and presenting them to our panelists um, today. Um, so maybe we can start with a few questions and then open it up for discussion. Um, Nuria, sounds like Spain is going through some uh, similar challenges that we here in the United States are facing in terms of the second surge, partic particularly in Barcelona, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about Kiran Salud's experience as, as you're currently dealing with the second surge, but also some lessons learned um, and critical steps you may have taken um, in taking care of patients as well as keeping your employees safe? Yes, for sure. Thank you, Christian, Prakash, and the Cleveland Clinic. First, I'd like to, to thank you all for the invitation for, to participate in this webinar. It's an honor and a privilege for Caron Salud to be part of this uh, webinar, and uh, uh, I'd be delighted to show and to share with you the different uh, actions that we um, took in order to come back to the new normal, as, as the webinar is mentioned. Uh, first, we, we Mm, focus on three main areas. Uh, first was the spaces or the hospitals as a whole, the professionals and the, um, and the patients. Um, we, mm, the first thing that we needed to do in order to come back to this new normal, because we had had a high volume of patients, especially in Madrid and in Barcelona, was to really disinfect these um, hospitals and all the um, the, the, the different uh, areas where these uh, COVID patients have been placed at, at, at once. Um, because pretty much all hospitals were COVID patients. We didn't have any other type of uh, patients uh, or at least very, very low volume. 
So we um, did some disinfection, full disinfection with high technology like ultraviolet rays. Uh, we used in, in, in all the um, spaces of, of the hospital. We did um, exhaustive and intensive cleaning um, disinfection of all different areas, also not only areas, but also all the medical instrumentation. This was done firstly to make sure that the environment was fully safe, fully clean in order to bring in uh, healthy patients and reactivate the normal activity of, of the hospitals. And also um, it was something needed for professionals and patients in order to be more confident in the spaces and reuse of the healthcare system. Uh, we used also a very intensive uh, uh, increase the cleaning method in the hospital. And that's something that um, has been valued by, by patients and also by, by professionals. After we did all the cleaning, we decided we needed to make uh, different circuits and different paths for the COVID patients and non-COVID patients. We wanted to reactivate our normal activity, uh, but we needed to make sure that we kept the patients not mixed and we kept um, different paths and safe paths for each of the patients to, to follow. Managing this situation, we already had to identify the areas in the hospitals and the different hospitals that would be COVID patients and the areas in the hospitals that would be non-COVID patients. We um, did a lot of training during the crisis of the pandemic regarding the use of the PPEs. I think this is a key point here because we were quite fortunate in Corona Salud to not have scars of uh, a stock of PPEs, which was not the situation in other healthcare institutions. Um, professionals became quite creative in order to, to protect themselves. It was not the case here, so we did a lot of training on the correct use of PPEs and in defining which PPE had to be used in, in which area. Uh, we went a little ahead, I think, before the crisis came. So we had that stock, that safety stock, in order to give service and in order to give, uh, to be able for all professionals to be protected and, uh, for this crisis. And we are still maintaining this. So for sure, um, we have defined the correct PPE you must use for our area that we uh, previously had defined. And we continuously are reinforcing this because this is something important, not only to protect professionals, but also to protect our patients. Uh, also, um, regarding professionals, we did test to, to all of them. I think this was something that um, professionals also valued a lot because at this time also it was quite difficult to get tested. Um, there were some scarce um, resources regarding the, um, the test. So we were able to test all our professionals. We did the screening and we were able to classify. All the uh, patients that were um, positive, I'm, I'm sorry, the professionals that were positive were home referral. And for sure, we did a very close uh, medical active surveillance in order to track them and in order to understand what their situation was. So this also helped um, keep the professionals that were healthy, safe, and the professionals that were infected away. And we made a follow-up to just to make sure that um, we were tracking them closely. I think one of the biggest um, benefits that we have from, from being a part of Kiran Salud is the, uh, uh, the large institution that we are. We have different hospitals, different sizes, 52 in, in, in Spain. So um, sharing those clinical sessions and sharing the knowledge and sharing the experiences really reinforced and helped us build something that was um, innovative, creative, and at the same time, that uh, it was very helpful for everybody. So we did these clinical sessions during the pandemic and we're also maintaining this because we saw that um, the hospitals that had our heaviest uh, um, volume of, of patients were able to help a lot. Hospitals that were coming, new patients were coming in and it was something new to them. So this was something that also professionals were quite keen with it and uh, really appreciated uh, sharing this knowledge and learning from, from each other. Another thing, um, creating the flows, if we go to the patient's area, uh, we wanted to minimize at most the contact that the patient had during the interactions in their patient flow. Um, usually a patient comes into the hospital, they need to go to the reception desk and do the check-in and do all this paperwork. We were able to mitigate all those steps and do um, auto automatize all these steps through the mobile. Um, we are very um, looking forward to making processes more lean, uh, avoiding all those touch points with the patients and trying to get uh, um, uh, 
take away those steps that are um, manual and that require face-to-face -face because we believe that um, they don't add value and, uh, and uh, there, there's also a risk there. So we, we mitigated this. When we, we were trying to um, reactivate all the surgeries and all the activity, out, uh, outpatient consultation, the ED, and the surgeries, first uh, we needed to contact the patients that had had their surgeries canceled. At, at the crisis, we needed to, we, we had to cancel all the surgeries and all the outpatient consultations. So we called them in and we tried to, exp we, we explained to them that we were already a safe environment. We had disinfected, we had different circuits uh, for COVID and non-COVID patients, but we felt that we needed to take a little step forward. So what we did was we uh, called an external entity in order to certify that our protocols were put in place and that we were really a safe um, environment for patients to come in. So we got a COVID um, safe hospital, it was called, by uh, an external entity that recognized the uh, put in place of all these protocols. This was something that I think patients appreciated because they felt that uh, um, we had gone through all the recommendations we had to do in order to, to become a safe um, environment. And also it was good for professionals because I think it was a way to recognize all the hard work in, in bringing back the, the normal, the normal uh, activity. Uh, we also um, took a lot of actions regarding patients. We did a lot of information, not only in the hospital with um, banners and with uh, different uh, uh, panels, but also in the patient portal, which is our, um, uh, where we keep all the medical records. Our patients can download this portal and they will have all the patient uh, records and we can also inter um, uh, interact with the patients. So we put up a lot of information for our patients there. Uh, we limited the um, amount of patients that were in place in the waiting rooms. Uh, we did a lot of hand washing, face masks mandatory, limited companions. Uh, so with different actions, the uh, thermographic, uh, the thermal imaging cameras in order to go into to our centers. So all these different actions also uh, were displayed and seen by the patients that also gave them some confidence in what that the, the place they were going in was, was a safe place and um, that uh, they could do uh, and, and reactivate their normal checkups and routine checkups. We faced, uh, the first phase was more critical patients uh, chronic patients or cancer patients or patients that needed a surgery that had been uh, um, suspended for, for the crisis. And I could say that now we're almost 100% uh, at, at the level of the uh, normal activity we had in the, um, in the past. The truth is um, bringing back uh, the whole situation that we had to create during the crisis was quite more difficult than being so creative during the crisis as I'm creating those new new spaces. Something that um, this situation forced us to do was innovate, uh, continuously innovate, adapt solutions to, to the daily demand. It was depending on the situation of the, um, of the hospital that the demands were different. But the thing that was uh, very helpful is um, having those uh, contact between the whole group and the whole entity in order to, to move forward. Uh, one of the things we also oh, yeah. did for sure. Yes. If I may ask a quick uh, comment is that it's hard enough coming up with these protocols and policies for one facility, let alone make sure that all of them are uniformly shared across 50 facilities, not only in Spain, but also other facilities across the globe. Um, so later on in the conversation, we can touch on uh, possibly um, um, how you shared that information across facilities and, and across multiple um, care delivery uh, platforms as, as well. Um, sure. if, if I can uh, quickly get our other panelists involved as well. Dr. Guterres, um, London, Cleveland Clinic London's not open yet, but you're in the heat of construction. Can you talk a little bit about how to keep, how you've kept um, our caregivers safe uh, while building a new hospital in London? but also maybe touch on some of the challenges you faced with travel and, and being, not being in the office and how to build a, I guess a, there should be a new webinar, how to build a hospital during a pandemic, but any mm -hmm. thoughts from you uh, from London? 
I would definitely want to watch that webinar, webinar, Prakash. But yeah, thank, thank you. And, and Nuria, that's fantastic. Great work um, that you and your team have done in Spain and continue to do. Um, as Prakash mentioned, we're in a different situation here in London, not only because we're in a different country, um, but I think more importantly, the fact that we are currently building uh, a new private hospital in central London here. You could see the picture on the screen. Uh, we hope to open it next year. Um, so, you know, rather than having to worry about keeping both our employees uh, as well as our patients safe, our focus here has really been solely on keeping our, our office workers, our caregivers safe. Uh, we have an office right next to the building you see here. Uh, we have over 220 caregivers currently on our team working to bring this hospital to life. And um, we certainly have gone through the full spectrum in terms of deactivating and now preparing to reactivate again um, in the wake of, of, of the, what we hope is the worst of COVID here in London. Um, first and foremost, we certainly have followed government guidance, but our goal has always been to use that as a minimum and always strive to exceed government guidance in terms of keeping our caregivers safe. So, you know, with that in mind, we actually decided to close our offices about a week and a half to two weeks before there was a general shutdown in the UK and very quickly pivoted to working remotely. Um, myself and several of my colleagues actually returned to the US to be with family at that point where the bulk of our caregivers stayed in London. And we were able to quite effectively continue to meet our milestones and deadlines and work remotely despite the differences in location and, and time zones. Um, I'm happy to say that we are in the final stages of our about six weeks of preparations now to return to our office. I'm actually in our offices now, and we will bring our first cohort of caregivers back in next week. Um, we actually took an approach that number one, again, prioritized the safety of our caregivers. Uh, and we did that in a couple of ways. Number one, um, we really worked hard to survey and engage our caregivers in advance of opening the office so that we can really make sure we heard their voices about their input on how to do it safely. And we wanted to make sure we understood their particular fears and concerns about coming back. You know, based on that, we're taking a cohorted approach uh, where we're going to consider not only um, a person's, the work that they need to do and, and whether that work can be done more effectively in an office environment, but also understand their individual and family risks around COVID, uh, their risks around transportation, getting to the office, as well as their preference. Because, because as you can imagine, we have some people who haven't had the most optimal work environments at home and are looking forward to getting back into the, a more comfortable office environment. Um, so after stratifying our workforce, we've put into place physical and environmental controls. Um, Nuria talked a lot about cleaning regimens. We found that it's important not only to implement those, but to make sure they're visible so people can really see that cleaning being done periodically throughout the day. Um, We've gone to one-way traffic moving around our office to maintain physical distancing. We've decided to maintain physical distancing at two meters plus, even though the government recently relaxed standards to one meter in order to try to get people back out into the community and into the business places. Um, we, we also have redone policies. Uh, we've implemented thermal scanning for, for all of our caregivers, and we're facilitating testing for COVID for any of our caregivers who become symptomatic, realizing that here in the UK in the National Health Service, there still are some challenges in getting diagnostic testing done for COVID. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, I think we've clearly learned uh, and we've taken some great lessons from Cleveland in emphasizing the importance of communication. We have communicated on a daily basis to our caregivers about the status of not only the COVID situation, but what was going on at the organizational level and here in London. Um, we have, we've continued throughout the whole shutdown uh, to have weekly all caregiver meetings that are led by Brian Donnelly, our chief executive, and we will continue to do that after we start to reopen. Uh, and then also we're planning on implementing a program of monitoring, measuring and adjusting not only keeping on top of what's going on in the country in terms of the disease 
any evidence of recurrence and recommendations, but also monitoring how our caregivers do in terms of how they come back to the office so that we can correct our course if we feel that that's appropriate. Um, you know, beyond that, in terms of our construction site right next door, um, we've engaged very closely uh, with our general contractor and the various trade groups that are working there. Um, we've really supported them in figuring out how to accomplish physical distancing on a workplace where you have over, over 600 individuals coming to work every day to work on that building. And we certainly have been a source of expert guidance for them and for all of the contracting groups in terms of understanding how to try to stay safe so that we can keep construction going uh, while at the same time minimizing the risk of any COVID infection among the workforce. So I think I'll stop there and, and turn things back over to Prakash. I'll, I'm sure some other questions or comments will come up during question and answers, but thank you. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Gutierrez and, and, and Maria. And, and for folks on, on the line, uh, if you do have questions, please enter them into the Q&A section. Um, thankfully, Christian does speak Spanish, so if you want to enter questions in Spanish, that's okay too. Um, um, Tony, yeah, um, if we can move to you real quick. Um, you, you and your teams oversee not only quality and safety for the clinic, but also patient experience, as well as improving the processes that we have in place. So. In, in, in terms of what you're doing, not only here in Cleveland, but also uh, across the myriad of uh, facilities we have in Northeast Ohio, in Florida, uh, uh, Vegas, Canada, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about how we're bringing surgeries back, elective surgeries back, how we're bringing our uh, routine care back, or we already have in the last uh, month or so, and how we're continuing to maintain a safe facility uh, for our caregivers to work in? Sure. Thanks, Prakash, and thanks, Dr. Gutierrez, and thank you, Nuria. It's it's great uh, to learn from so many other organizations and partners around the world for, for what we're what they're doing, and uh, the Cleveland Clinic is learning from those best practices. We're also you know pleased to be sharing what we're doing with with folks around the world. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the resources that we have available for free for for anyone on, on the line um, to access on our website, but. Uh, just as Nuria and Dr. Gutierrez mentioned, there are so many interventions that can and should be put in place, and each one in and of itself isn't going to be perfect. You've got to think about these as you know various layers of protection that if you put them all in place, you're going to keep your workforce and your patients and your customers and your visitors and, and whoever whoever uh, your stakeholders are, you're going to keep them safe. You know, a mask in and of itself isn't going to be a perfect solution. Physical distancing isn't going to be enough in and of itself. Hand washing, while very important, isn't going to be enough in and of itself. So all of these things put together, temperature screening isn't going to be enough in and of itself. All of these things put together are going to be your comprehensive way to keep everybody safe. So one of the things that we did in the, at the Cleveland Clinic um, in order to keep this messaging very simple for for all of our employee our all of our employee caregivers is to make sure that we had effective and clear communication so we had daily messages from our CEO throughout this crisis um, email messages video messages every day he would be he would be communicating to every one of our uh, workforce um, we also had an uh, we took over our intranet and turned it into our COVID portal with a toolkit, updated and refreshed resources that were constantly being um, updated with new policies, procedures, checklists, um, all of the tools that are important in quality and safety. We would use those and leverage that communication portal so that no matter where you were in our enterprise, we could go to that place as the source of truth for whatever the new and current information was for our workforce. We also had a command center that had representation from across our, our uh, health system that met to make decisions so that we can make quick and timely informed decisions that mattered most to our healthcare organization. And we also put a lot of effort in place to not only make sure that we had the tools and equipment for our workforce, whether it was personal protective equipment, um, 
or other uh, other types of equipment for our workforce, but also that they we were supporting them with emotional support. We were also supporting them with resources that they might need uh, personally. So if you think about our nurses in the hospital, um, you know, working a long shift and restaurants were closed, how could we help them with meals to be able to bring back home for their family? So thinking about not just their physical needs, but also what are their personal needs? How can we make life easier for them? They were extending themselves by working um, in a difficult situation. How can we help our workforce in other ways too? Um, and as we think about this crisis in, in, in the United States, as we, as we see cases continuing to rise, how do we make sure that we don't forget about those solutions that we put in place early on in the crisis so that we could keep our workforce supported uh, both physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in all of those ways. So we try to make sure that we have a multifaceted approach. We also recognize that we don't have all the answers as leaders. We need to listen to our workforce. And while communication was free flowing, we needed to listen. We put listening stations in place so we had opportunities for our workforce to contribute back to us, to tell us what they needed, what, what, they, what they wanted us to know. And we did a formal uh, survey of them, uh, a short pulse survey, we called it, where we took the pulse of our workforce across the organization. We surveyed them um, over the course of two weeks and in late June to get feedback from them, not only about uh, how our communication methods were, were working and how the support and resources we were providing were working, but also to gauge our culture, to gauge the culture of their ability and, and ability to speak up and how policies and procedure working were working, how they felt, whether they felt safe. Um, and we had overwhelming participation, nearly 90% participation in that survey uh, across our 65,000 caregivers across the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, stress reduction is also a very important component in any organization's plan. So thinking about how you can uh, support your workforce with managing stress in very difficult times, not only work-related stress, but personal stress. So I'm sure that in your companies, you have, um, uh, your employees have family situations where whether they have family that have been personally impacted by COVID uh, through health issues or employment status, or whether they were furloughed or their employment was impacted or their wages were impacted. That, in, that adds a lot of stress to families. So how can you as an organization help support, um, help support them with uh, counseling or other resources through those stressful situations? We put together a hotline at the Cleveland Clinic so that our caregivers could call and get uh, support in those, uh, for those things as well. Prakash, you asked about what we're doing uh, to uh, address patient experience. So um, it's been a challenge with patient experience because while our patients have uh, looking at the, our caregiver, our patient experience with a new lens in COVID, they're inc they've increased their respect for healthcare providers greatly. They look at healthcare providers with new confidence and they see a new level of empathy in our, in our healthcare providers, but they also see new frustrations in the fact that they can't visit their loved ones anymore as much as freely. We had very liberal visitation policies at the Cleveland Clinic where we had open visitation before COVID that patients could visit their loved ones at any time uh, with, with very few restrictions. Now with COVID, um, uh, for most of the duration of COVID, there was, there was no visitation. Now we tried to offer uh, virtual visitation using technology platforms so that they could interact with uh, through FaceTime and other technology, but it's not the same as being able to be there with your loved one and hold his or her hand. Uh, so that's caused a lot of frustration. Similarly, masking guidelines have caused frustration. We, we have seen an increase in complaints. It's interesting. We get complaints from uh, some of our visitors around having to wear masks. And then we also get complaints from some of our visitors when they see people not wearing masks. So um, there's frustrations on both ends of that spectrum. Um, uh, also, just lastly, I want to comment in terms of our readiness efforts. Uh, I would be remiss to not comment on the fact that we, we uh, converted our health education campus, which is a large 
multidisciplinary health education center, which has our medical school, our nursing school, our dental school, actually two medical schools. We converted that campus into a temporary facility to house uh, less acute COVID positive patients. If we had a surge that we needed to, we, we put medical gas in there. We put, uh, it was a, we built it up to be able to house up to a thousand patient beds. Um, we did not have to actually put patients in there, but it was ready to go. Um, we have since uh, been able to decommission that hospital. We called it the Hope Hospital. Um, and fortunately, we did not have to use it, but we were ready. That was part of our readiness plan. Now, if the surge comes back, we do feel like we'll be able to handle that with our existing bed capacity, but we were prepared with our command center. We did uh, activate that um, medical school uh, campus to be able to house additional patients. So I know that was a lot of uh, information and I'd be happy to go into more detail with any follow-up questions. Yeah, that, that's great. And we're getting some of those questions uh, from our um, audience as well. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. If, if I may ask um, to all three of you really, um, Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Florida and London, as well as Curon Salud in Spain and other locations. You're not only taking care of patients, but you're also um, uh, a, a huge part of your community. So, so can you touch on how um, you are helping um, the community, whether that's other organizations, whether that's uh, spreading education? Yeah, I could start with that and then um, hand it off to the others. So. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, we have put together a lot of resources at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, the website that you see on the screen right now, the the, the listing at the top, ClevelandClinic.org/COVID19 at work, um, is a place where we are cu we've curated a lot of resources, including a weekly free webinar series. Um, and if you click the screen, Christian, you'll see another. Uh, slide with industry specific guidebooks. So these are all downloadable guides about getting back to the, each of these industries safely. Um, and if you click again, um, you'll see that we've partnered with, uh, these are just a sampling of some of the other uh, companies that the Cleveland Clinic has partnered with to develop evidence-based solutions and practices uh, in safe in safety um, uh, and best practices in the era of COVID. And then I think one more slide. Here's an example of the new uh, building blocks in robust cleaning and disinfection practices that we put together. This was just published last week on our website. Again, this is a free guide you could download. Um, and this was done in partnership with Clorox that we published last week. And I think that might be the last one, but uh, yeah, we've done a number of these uh, types of guides and a lot of really good resources. And again, a weekly webinar series uh, that's available to anyone that's interested. We go deeper into some of these topics. Great. Thank, thank you, Tony. Maybe we can jump quickly to Spain and then to London. Nuria, can you, can you talk a little bit about how you're helping, um, particularly the... Hard hit community. I'm in mute, I'm sorry. Since the initiate, in the initial of the pandemic, um, uh, we offered uh, our institutions to the official health, health authorities in Spain because all patients that were um, being uh, um, identified as COVID were treated in the public sector. But uh, we offer our installations, our hospitals, our even equipment and, um, at some point. Um, so we were open to either treat or help out treating in, in their hospitals. We also did some um, um, support to the uh, pharmaceutical school and also to the uh, medical schools in order to, to understand what the situation is and to do all that fast research that we could be, that we were doing at the, ta at the same time that we were receiving these patients. So we were doing a very close collaboration with them in order to, this, this was a crisis not only uh, in healthcare, but it was a country crisis. So I think um, one of the experiences that I could say that uh, brought the whole, everybody together and to sum up and say, what can I do? And uh, so for sure, we were very active in here because we mainly in Madrid and in Barcelona, as, as I mentioned, we had 15, um, uh, 15 um, patients. So 
it was a quite heavy volume of patients coming into our, our hospitals. And uh, in the other regions, uh, our hospitals were open for any necessity from the health authorities in, in, in Spain. Also for sure, informing patients, uh, um, a lot of uh, volunteering. Um, we had a lot of professionals moving from one place to the other to help out and, 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 and without any interest. So there's uh, coming together and summing up all these actions, I think had a great impact in the, in the society and for sure we were active, very active. And I might add in terms of London, um, there was an incredible and I think an un unprecedented amount of cooperation and collaboration between the National Health Service here and the private hospital sector in meeting the challenges of COVID. I think our biggest disappointment at Cleveland Clinic London was that we did not yet have a functional hospital and outpatient facility to participate in that collaboration. But that said, um, we had a number of our caregivers um, really help to support the needs of patients here in the UK. Um, many of our, in fact, all of our consultants, our doctors, still have NHS practices or had retired from the NHS. So they all continued to do their NHS work. Several came out of retirement to go back to the NHS. And it was interesting to see that, you know, even the the doctors who did not take care of patients in critical care units or inpatient units, for instance, our orthopedic surgeons were really enlisted into the hospitals to go in and actually turn patients in the ICU on ventilators to prone them and take them off of the prone position. So it was really all hands on deck. Um, many of our nurses um, either went back to NHS hospitals where they had practiced to get back online, uh, or they trained to provide care at the Nightingale Hospital here, which similar to um, the hospital in Cleveland, the Hope Hospital that Tony talked about, um, here in London, they turned a large convention center into a thousand bed hospital for overflow. Uh, fortunately, like in Cleveland, uh, it, it only had to be used very slightly, uh, but it now has been decommissioned as well. But many of our nurses were prepared to practice there. Our deputy chief pharmacy officer here at Cleveland Clinic London actually led the setup of the pharmacy at the Nightingale Hospital and really served well. And several of our administrators went back into NHS hospitals where they had worked in the past to provide support during COVID. So we did feel better that many of our caregivers were able to support the community and support the needs. Um, you know, certainly we look forward to the day that we can participate uh, hopefully there won't be another pandemic like this anytime soon, but we really want to be uh, ready for that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Um, and uh, again, to the audience, we have, we have three questions already. We'll, we'll touch on some of the questions um, um, uh, now. But if I may ask real quick again to all three of you, sort of in, in your experience uh, from an operational perspective, um, how do you see the post-COVID world? Um, do you see any significant changes? You know, Tony, you talked, uh, touched on visitation, for example. Um, uh, do you see any significant changes in the post-COVID world that um, um, you see either not coming back or, or coming back in a new way? Tony, you want to start? Yeah, I think it's going to be... Um a while before we get back to what was the old normal. So I know the title of this webinar is what's the new normal. And I, uh, you know, in quality and safety, um, which is part of my scope at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, one of the areas that um, is in quality and safety is biosafety. So I was actually talking to our biosafety officer yesterday who manages things um, like how do we make sure we have safe spaces for research you know, so, you know, she was talking about how even if we have a vaccine for the coronavirus, there are, you know, globally, they're talking about there are other types of emerging pathogens. So, you know, we need to be prepared for the next one. So um, I think that this is hopefully will hopefully something that we'll learn from so that we'll be better prepared for the next uh, crisis. Um, and It'll be a while before that we before things get back to the the old normal. Um, 
hopefully people will uh, start to um, get get into that get into some better habits in terms of of hand hygiene and um, I think one of the things that will definitely change is how we work. So as Dr. Gutierrez mentioned in terms of some people, if they can work and be productive remotely instead of in an office-based setting, um, we're probably going to see people working more remotely for a, for a while now. I think we're going to start to see more use of these kinds of tools, web, web-based tools. Um, I think culturally we're going to start to see that. Um, I think the way people learn in schools are, is going to change. It's going to be transformed. I think we're going to see as people start to go back to school this fall, um, a big change in how education takes place. And um, those changes are going to be have a long, long lasting impact. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm working from home or living at work, but um, that aside, Nuria, any thoughts from you in terms of, operationally, how you see changes in the new normals? Yes, for sure. I fully agree with, with Tony. I think uh, um, the new way that we're going to work, uh, for sure, has already started. Uh, um, and I don't think that will go back to the old normal. I think that will become the new, the new normal. And also, I think the relationship that we will establish with patients and families, um, I think it will go more digital. Uh, for sure, we need to be present in the hospital and we need to to go in for checkups and for her, her surgeries. But there's a lot of things that can be done on a digital um, way, uh, especially information we can do. We actually are working on bringing up and how to improve information, medical information in a digital way. We're working with patients and how they would like to get that information. In And many um, uh, outpatient consultations that we could avoid like just uh, um, getting results or um, consultations that don't add value to the process, we believe that that's going to change. We increased dramatically the telematic um, um, consultations. We've created um, urgent consultations in what we call the digital hospital. So we have created like a virtual hospital that is an online hospital and that gives a lot of services to, to patients. So, and the patients are accepting and are really, really putting in value those services. So I think it's really, we, need, we will be redefining the system. We are, um, I think we were already doing it before COVID came in, but COVID is pushing us very, very hard in order to, to make all those changes quite quick because we cannot concentrate um, the huge amount of patients that we had in our premises. So we need to find new ways. So it's a challenge, it's a challenge for sure. But I think uh, this has brought us the capacity to, to innovate, to be very creative and to be very uh, quick in implementing. So uh, I think that we have to ride that wave and, and, and bring it through because it's, it's going to be accepted. Uh, maybe previously patients were not so keen on having telematic uh, consultations, but uh, now some of them that could be held are for sure something that patients get value to. Dr. Yeah. Gutierrez, your hospital is gonna open in the new normal. Any thoughts on what changes you may be making already? Yeah, no, I, I, I guess for better or for worse, we're in a position where we can make some changes now, you know, on the fly uh, to, to meet the new normal. I think from a clinical perspective, we're looking again, obviously at physical space. How do you design space that you know, kind of maintains physical distancing and keeps people safe, both patients and caregivers, while not depersonalizing it, having plastic screens everywhere. Um, the other thing we're really rethinking is a lot of handheld technologies. You know, we had talked about, you know, our patients having tablets to complete surveys, to do patient education, you know, to engage during their hospital stays in various ways with the team. Well, now you start to wonder about, you know, the liability of having um, pieces of equipment that are passed from patient to patient and patient to staff. So certainly we're rethinking our model, um, our care delivery model, as well as our strategy, certainly looking more at, at integrating virtual technologies, which many of our UK doctors here got their introduction to and now love it. Uh, and I think patients are loving it too. I think the, the other thing I'll say about, you know, the new non-healthcare workplace uh, really following up on some of the, some of the concepts that Tony brought up, 
I mean, I think we've all learned how to work more effectively using technologies like Zoom. Um, I think also we've learned some of the things we miss about the office space, right? That, that ability to connect with people on the fly and also just to see people in person. So I think we're going to be seeing more of a move toward a blended workplace where we're going to have people splitting time between being in the office and being out of the office. I think people who are calling in or connecting with meetings virtually aren't going to be second class participants anymore. I think people are going to feel fully engaged whether they're in the room or whether they're, you know, uh, attending virtually. Um, they, and I think also people will have the opportunity to, you know, look at different ways to commute. And we're going to have to look at that because in urban areas like London, you know, that's a huge challenge that we're struggling with. How do you deal with distancing? How do you deal with keeping people safe while you're working from a distance? Um, so certainly a lot of things around the new normal. Uh, I, I think the final thing would be just more of a decentralized workplace where rather than having everybody come into a central urban office, you know, I think we will see smaller, you know, less frequently used urban hubs with more use of offsite workspaces in the community, rented spaces, even public spaces, cafes, where people can have smaller meetings and get togethers without having to deal again with transportation with crowds. Right, thank, thank you all. So, so going to the audience questions here, and again, if people have questions, please put them into the Q&A section and we can uh, get our panelists to, to touch on those subjects. One of the questions here, Nuria, especially for you, is what we touched on earlier, which is how to communicate those best practices and policies across facilities. Can you touch on how you've been able to do that at Quran Salud? Yes, Please. for sure. Um, okay, when we developed the protocols and the best practice, it was a, like a continuous change because the, um, the Ministry of Health was continuously changing recommendations. So we did a, a weekly update or may even daily update at some cases. The way that we um, send that to the, um, to the hospitals is through uh, the me medical directors. So we had sessions, different um, information sessions in order to update on the, uh, we did very, very simple abstracts of these protocols in order to be very straightforward, um, easy to implement, and not give them very, a lot of um, hard time in interpreting or in trying to understand um, the developed uh, protocol, which was a lot more detail. So um, it was made pretty much like every day or every, every other day, we brought out information to them and then we did sessions in order to explain and for them to understand. Uh, I spoke earlier about the certification of the uh, um, put in place of these protocols also helped a lot because it was not only defining the protocols, but also making sure that we had the full implementation of these um, protocols. Um, medical uh, directors were the ones that deployed it throughout the uh, hospital, and we canalized everything again um, with them. Continuous sure. communication and for sure support and, uh, and training. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Nuria. Um, another question um, here from the audience. Uh, Tony, earlier in your presentation, you shared a slide that had United Airlines, Air Canada, Intercontinental Hotel, um, you know, some of the, uh, a select group of organizations that Cleveland Clinic is working with. So as, as travel resumes and, and uh, travel for care resumes, can you touch on what special protocols that you may have in place to support patients who may need to travel for care? And I'm sure that's just as applicable in London and Spain as well. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to get a little bit of background noise outside my house, but um, I may have to mute quickly. But the right now, there are a lot of international restrictions around travel in terms, in, including isolation and quarantine. So that, that, that's been one of the challenges. You know, Cleveland Clinic is fortunate to have a really um, valuable global patient services team who helps make all of those kinds of arrangements. So in addition to working with embassies and working with patients individually to make sure that they have a smooth transition and making all of those arrangements, they also work with our staff in terms of in, including the clinical team to address any special considerations with infection prevention and, and working on an individual plan to make sure that the travel can be done safely. Um, you know, the, the travel itself, while 
you know, the, the airport isn't necessarily uh, the risk, or, or even the plane for that matter. Um, there, there are a lot less safe places than those airplanes, uh, but there, there are mitigating, stra mitigating strategies that you can have for, for safe air travel. Um, it's not something to just do um, indiscriminately, but you can do that if you need to make, make travel arrangements for healthcare. Um, certainly, regular the routine protection, protections like masking, free, very frequent hand hygiene, um, managing. Uh, most of the airlines now are managing with symptom checking and temperature checking, which are very important as well. Um, and uh, so, those are definitely components that we're recommending with with all of our partners with the air, in the airline industry. And in fact, uh, we're working on a webinar. Uh, in August, uh, specifically focused on safe travel, which we'll make sure to post uh, with our international operations. We'll make sure to, to send, send that information out to the folks that are on this list. Thanks, Tony. Noria, any comments on that from a travel for care perspective? No, fully agree with Tony. I think that uh, um, I'm just taking the, uh, the recommendations and the precautions that are um, established by the authorities and uh, if you can avoid, for sure, uh, there's limitations on it, but uh, if there's a need, um, just uh, um, make sure that uh, um, the, the, the precautions are taken and, and, and that's it, Not, no, no more to add to that. Great, I, I, I know we have about five minutes um, uh, left. Dr. Gutierrez, there's a two-part question here for you. Um, one is, in, in the office setting that you described earlier, have you implemented any kind of uh, tracking uh, app for your workers and caregivers to track exposure and uh, I'm smiling because the second part of that question is uh, has your budget gone up because of all of these changes and by what percent? Uh, well, I'll take the first one first, less, less, less controversial probably. Um, so we, you know, we have not thought about uh, implementing a specific testing and tracing program for our caregivers here in London. You know, the main, main reason being that as we, um, you know, a, as we plan for the return, um, there was every expectation that the government here in the UK would implement their own testing and tracing system. Now, anyone who follows this knows that as it turns out, that program has had a number of kind of fits and starts. Um, some issues with technology, some issues with privacy. So it hasn't worked as well as planned, but it was, you know, too late for us to backtrack and implement our own. You know, I think where we chose to focus instead, and I touched on this briefly, was um, we felt that the gap that we could close was making sure that our caregivers who became symptomatic or had concerns about COVID had ready access to testing with a quick turnaround, which is something that isn't always available still here in the National Health Service. So we've partnered with our uh, private lab provider um, in order to either hand out tests to patients, who, to caregivers who become sick here, or post them out to our, our patients who become sick at home so that we can at least help them get a quick diagnosis so that they can get uh, either in, so that then they can get proper care. Um, I think the second part of that, what we do know about COVID definitely based on both impact on supply chain as well as just physically getting enough people on site is that it is going to cause a delay in our project here um, in terms of opening Cleveland Clinic London. And I think along with that is certainly gonna come an increase in budget uh, because of those delays. Um, the magnitude of that, you know, I think only time is going to tell. We're still working with our construction partners to determine uh, a reasonable opening date, and I'm sure that's something that will be forthcoming publicly as we start to get more clarity on that, Prakash. Right. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. Um, I know we have a couple of minutes left here. I uh, just want to open it up to the three of you. Any, uh, any topics that you may want to quickly touch on before uh, we say, in the case of my uh, friends from Australia, good night. Um, Tony, maybe we start with you. I know you stay up at night thinking about testing. Um, you wanna touch on that quickly? Well, testing, cer testing strategy certainly has been, a lot, has been on my mind a lot. I was impressed to hear uh, Nuria, Nuria speak earlier about uh, how they've been testing at Curan Salud and um, maybe for a future conversation, I think we probably are, don't have enough time today. I just want to thank everyone for being on the call today. 
and also thank you all for the work that you're doing in your communities and with your organizations to uh, keep your workforce safe, to keep your patients, your customers, uh, your community safe and wish you all the best and wish you all health and wellness uh, as we move forward through this crisis. Yeah, and, and I might add, I think if there's a silver lining in this, um, you know, I think the old adage is never waste a good crisis. You know, I think we certainly are here in London, uh, I think at the enterprise level, and, and I think we all need to look at, you know, what opportunity is this gonna create for us uh, to unexpectedly expand into new avenues, grow our business, or continue to change more quickly to make us better in the future. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, trying to insert some positivity there is something that uh, I think would help everybody who's listening in. Yes, fully agree with both of you, for sure. Um, I would definitely say that this crisis gave us the capacity to innovate and, and to create uh, new scenarios and new atmospheres that if we look back in time would have taken us a lot, a lot longer. So I think um, take the positive um, for sure and, uh, and let's create a, a better future and, and um, more efficient and keep creating and innovating for sure. It's a pleasure to be with all of you and, and a privilege to be sharing this webinar with uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Well, I, I want to thank you. I, uh, it's it's, it's 9, 9 a.m. here in Cleveland, 11 p.m. In, in Sydney. Um, thank the three of you for your participation this morning, uh, evening, night. Um, but also thank uh, want to thank our global audience uh, for joining our episode five today. Um, I know we'll be hosting many more of these in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned. Um, there are also other... Um, uh, webinars and resources available from Kiran Salud, from our Cleveland Clinic London team and our Cleveland team. So please contact uh, a member of our team if you have questions or, 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 or uh, thoughts after this webinar. Um, you should also receive a survey uh, at the end of this uh, webinar today. Uh, please send us your feedback. Um, uh, we always make sure we incorporate uh, your thoughts into uh, what topics we have webinars on in the future. So thank you again, uh, all of you. Uh, please be safe. Thank you all. Thank you all.